Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bull Breakdowns here on the Guilty as Charged podcast YouTube channel. I am Alex. As always, we are two weeks out from the draft, and I thought that I would do a mock draft uh, simulation uh, and talk about some of the possibilities for the Chargers on board. I had realized I had actually never done uh, a mock draft uh, simulation like video or anything uh, with the guys, uh, Steven and Tyler, this year. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know, I can make kind of my own uh, video where I talk about uh, some of the scenarios and how they would play out. So specifically today, I want to go into what I would do in the stick and pick at five scenario and then what I would do in the trade back scenario. For the purposes of this discussion, this would be me making the picks and my thoughts on the prospects and the value at each spot. Not necessarily what Harbaugh and Hortiz will do, although we will. Uh, talk about that at, at each spot in terms of what they could be thinking, but this will just be kind of my mock draft and sort of some of my thoughts uh, here. But I uh, I did get a little FOMO, I guess, uh, missing <laughs> seeing the Trevor Sikama dueling mock drafts today. I was like, damn, that used to be me in recent years. So, um, you know, let's uh, get right into it and start with the stick and pick at five scenario. Uh, so the board plays out pretty on brand, pretty as expected. You have the three quarterbacks, and then Marv goes to the Cardinals. Obviously, the Cardinals are a team that can can trade back. I ultimately kind of do think the closer that we get to the draft, that the Cardinals are kind of a – I wouldn't call them a Marvin Harrison Jr. no matter what team, but I do think the overwhelming likelihood, unless they get some crazy offer for J.J. McCarthy, which I don't know how to like really – justify or like believe that smoke it, it does have a little will levis vibes um to it in terms of like how serious it is and four quarterbacks in the first four picks is always something that gets talked about every year uh but does it actually happen right and this kind of would be the class for it to happen but i still have my doubts uh, as i said on my show with um nick Kimes last week so uh, yeah uh, I think that this is kind of, if you were to simulate it a million times, this is what the most likely board gives you. And I, I think this is kind of the pretenses of what we should operate under. I'm not saying Marvin Harrison Jr. won't be there at 5-1 draft night. I think it's very possible, uh, especially if the Cardinals do trade down uh, and get some haul. But I, I do think that this is kind of uh, the scenario that Chargers fans should be kind of, I guess, living with. I guess, uh, in, into draft night. And if Marv's there, great, run in the pick and, and run out <laughs> as fast as you can. Uh, but I, I really do think this is kind of what they will be dealing with when making the decision to either stay at five or trade back. But as I said, this first simulation will be just sticking and picking at five. And I ultimately do think that the best player on the board here is Malik Neighbors. Uh, dating back four years when we kind of started scouting and, and, and doing all the All-22 stuff for the draft and for the GAC channel. Um, Malik Neighbors is the third receiver I have uh, ranked in that like top five guys that I've ever graded. I have Marv number one, Jamar Chase number two, and then Malik number three. Um, and I think that he, the open field explosiveness that he would bring the contested catch ability that he brings, the route running ability that he brings. You just don't get that many chances in the draft uh, to have someone with his freak um, athleticism. He is, you know, was arguably kind of the best wide receiver like in college football this year, um, you know, on, on a production basis, even though I think Marv is the better prospect ultimately. Uh, Neighbors has shown it again year in and year out um, that he can be a true wide receiver one uh, in this league. And I think you look at what the Chargers have in this situation now with Keenan Allen gone, with uh, Mike Williams gone, they need that true wide receiver one. And uh, I think Malik is a great way to get that started. Now, under a previous regime, I don't know if, you know, with the Quinton Johnston pick last year, say, and if Telesco was still here scenario, if Malik would be the pick. Um, but I, I think with this new regime, not necessarily having ties to any of the previous players drafted, I think you just have to build out the room uh, in a way that um, will best suit the Chargers to become contenders. And I think Malik Neighbors, while n no prospect in this draft makes the Chargers instant contenders in year one, 
um, because of the state of their roster and how bad it is right now. I think Malik Neighbors is a way to accelerate uh, that rebuild as Marvin Harrison Jr. also would be. I think you need to give Herbert a true long-term, you know, number one receiver now that you've taken Keenan Allen away from him, given everything that happened with the contract. Um, so I, I think you have to go the league neighbors here with how great I think he is. Um, he really reminds me a lot of prime uh, Odell, to be honest, those first few years in New York. Uh, anytime that I watch either highlights of him or all 22 of him, just a very smart uh, physical player too. And also, you know, blocks his ass off is honestly something that you also see on the all 22 tape uh, that I think is really interesting. Just a very high effort, high intensity uh, player that is one of the best wide receiver prospects I've seen in the last four or five years. So for me, it's not a debate. I would go with Malik Neighbors, but what do I think the Chargers would do in this scenario? Joe Walt is obviously on the board and Joe Walt does get ragged on a lot by Chargers fans. Uh, he is, you know, a popular mock pick here, given the, you know, uh, perceived offensive line investment uh, with Harbaugh in the fold and Roman in the fold. Um, you know, could they put Joe Alt uh, at right tackle, Slater at left tackle? Uh, there is some data to show that the actual, like, switch of doing that is not as, you know, bad as it is perceived by some fans. That was posted by uh, MIBPJ on Twitter. So, I don't know if that really factors a lot into their pick, but frankly, I just think Malik is the better prospect than Joe Alt. And I think that positionally uh, wide receiver is obviously a, a bigger need than tackle right now. Although Trey Pipkins is not something that long-term should prevent you from getting a tackle in the future. If you want to do that, um, I think that you, you know, go with the better player here. And for me, that is Malik Neighbors. Everyone else, I, I mean, other than maybe Odunze, I think is really trade back territory for the Chargers once you start to get into some of these players. Outside chance of like Bowers at five, maybe, but like I, I really think his draft stock has kind of cooled off a bit from what it was earlier in the process as a result of not testing uh, and, and some other stuff. So I, I think all of these other prospects, honestly, are kind of trade back at 11 scenarios. The two that I think really could be drafted at five as the board has played out our neighbors and alt i think the chargers honestly would take alt uh on the day of the draft if you you know put a gun to my head but you don't have to put a gun to my head because i am taking Malik neighbors at five uh so that is how we will start off our mock draft um that brings us to round two obviously now there's a lot of choices for the chargers on the board here Kool-Aid fell to round two in this scenario. I'm not going to like completely write that off and say that that doesn't happen. He does have the Jones fracture uh, injury, which is something to watch out for as he's recovering from that. So there are some teams that might have some medical things on him, but ultimately I do think Kool-Aid goes round one. I would be pretty surprised if he didn't. Um, so I think really when I look at it in round two in a scenario where I take neighbors in round one, I think you have the three corner and you have a bunch of corners here, uh, including Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, although I, you know, sort of sell the idea, <laughs> the idea he'll be there. So I'm kind of not going to take him. Uh, but you have TJ Tampa, Mike Zaner still, Kamari Lassiter, uh, Ennis Rakestraw still on the board. He's a guy that actually could slide into the back of round one as well. Um, and then, you know, we're obviously not going to take wide receiver round two this early, although <laughs> that would be the very <laughs> Alex mock draft uh, to do is just uh, take all seven wide receivers and a running back and <laughs> figure out the rest later. Um, but I really do think when I have looked over this scenario, the more and more I've thought about it, I think this comes down to two uh, debates for me, or I guess two uh, ideas to debate here, either corner or Zach Frazier. Uh, Zach Frazier, I think, is the ideal uh, interior offensive line guy, center that can carry the Chargers for quite a while to come up here. And I think he would, you know, fit the Roman scheme very well. One of the best run blockers in the class and really just in college uh, was like insane. I, I think he's allowed uh, something along the lines. Uh, I, I looked at the stats a couple of weeks ago. I think it's like it's like, yeah, as it says here, like four sacks in like his three full seasons as a starter, which is absolutely um, insane. 
uh, charting and obviously hasn't allowed very many pressures as well. He, along with Jackson Powers Johnson, make up the true uh, great center prospects in this class. And uh, the Chargers did sign Bradley Bozeman, which I think is worth mentioning. But I don't think Bradley Bozeman, considering the salary he's on, considering the fact that he is over 30 and also is coming off of, you know, granted it's Carolina and they had their own offensive line issue the last year. He is coming off of the worst uh, pressures allowed season of his career with 32. I do think he is due for a rebound season if he were to be a starter, but I don't think Bozeman, you know, prevents you from drafting a Zach Frazier if the Chargers have him graded as like the highest prospect on the board here, which obviously um, Sikama and the, the other people at PFF have him graded, you know, pretty, pretty high here compared to the corners. Um, but then you have Sainer still, obviously, Lassiter. I think those are both, you know, stud cornerback prospects. Mike Sainer still, obviously, a lot of connections to the current coaching staff with Harbaugh and Clink scale there. And so he would be a shoe in on slot corner. Uh, and I think that's uh, honestly a great pick. He is, in my opinion, ignoring Kool-Aid for a second, who I really don't think will be there. Um, he is the best cornerback on the board here. Uh, and it, it, it comes down to him versus, um, I, I would say, uh, oh, sorry. I don't know why that happened. It comes down to, um, I would say, Sam still versus Frazier here. For me, I'm going to go with Zach Frazier and kind of build out the interior offensive line and maybe uh, make a take my medicine pick after I do the neighbors one. I'm not enthralled by offensive line play, but I do really think that this is the direction to take the Chargers uh, kind of into the future of their offensive line here and, you know, kind of get through this Corey retiring phase. I don't think that prevents Bozeman from starting on day one, um, but I also don't think Bozeman's contract and, and his production last year precludes you from taking an interior offensive line here. And I think you can wait a little bit on corner. Um, to me, I have Frazier graded as a higher prospect uh, than I do Samer Stiller or Lassiter. I think it's close um, in terms of what I would do here, but I ultimately do think the best value on the board for me is Zach Frazier. So I'm going to take him uh, with our second pick here. All right, that brings us to the third round. Uh, and we have a lot of choices. Uh, we have Jonathan Brooks still pretty much, I think all the running backs are still available. I don't know how realistic that is on draft day to actually play out. I don't think a single running back has been taken. Obviously the Chargers, that's a big need for them in this draft. And I do think, uh, I think it was Jordan Reed, maybe who said it on a podcast that once you get past pick 50, you're going to see a lot of running backs start to come off the board uh, it, in a pretty quick manner. So I think we'll see that once we get to the Chargers uh, fourth round pick uh, it, here in a bit. So a uh, couple choices here, obviously the Chargers could go with somebody like Edge Cooper, who they have privately visited with, um, or not privately, it's a public visit. It's it's known information, but yes, they have hosted Edge and Cooper, I think, at the Chargers uh, facility that is known. Uh, they have Kyrie Jackson here on the board at corner, uh, can go running back, Jalen Wright also on the board, Blake Corum still on the board. A lot of choices the Chargers can make here, but... I kind of think that the best prospect here is Oregon's Kyrie Jackson. Um, I think the age is a little concerning. Uh, he did end the season with a torn labrum and is 25. But I think that kind of matters less if you're drafting a corner than, like, say, a running back with, like, high mileage. I'm not as concerned with the age, although it is a factor if you're kind of comparing him to the other corners that could be available. But I really do think the Chargers need a true – outside corner presence and Jackson is somebody that can come in on day one and, and kind of immediately provide that uh, for the Chargers. Um, he is, you know, one of the better coverage corners in this class, one of the better run defenders. Um, I think he's an immediate kind of fit in this defense and you can kind of just stick him on the outside, have something, you know, like, you know, the ASJ, Jackson Fulton rotation. And then maybe you could take a slot corner later, depending on how the value plays out. Um, but I really do think the Chargers need a true outside corner going forward. ASJ heading into the last year of his deal. Um, and then obviously, you know, Fulton is kind of a big unknown at this point, right? Um, I, I think he could bounce back under the winter defense, but it's not something I think they should necessarily bet on in a way that prevents them from taking another corner. 
kind of like I mentioned a little bit with Bozeman in the center position earlier. Um, so to me, corner is is the biggest need here. I also do like Brandon Dorless a lot um, uh, as a potential uh, pick here to fill that interior. There are a couple other names that I do like uh, a little bit more on the draft board, though, and I think the depth at corner tends to uh, go down a little bit quickly in terms of how many guys are instantly startable starting after this round. So for me, the best pick on the board here is Kyrie Jackson. Uh, and so I'm going to take him. Uh, that fills our need at corner. We can also double dip at corner later if there's a great slot guy that we like, um, but it, it would uh, kind of fulfill the Chargers need there. So we have gone neighbors, Frazier, and then Kyrie Jackson uh, at corner here, which uh, gives us a lot of uh, range for what we can do in round four. The Chargers obviously have two picks in this round after trading Keenan Allen. This could be a running back spot. You see Ray Davis on the board. You see Marshawn Lloyd on the board. Uh, Lloyd with obviously a connection to the Chargers uh, current running back coach. Um, which is notable, probably going into draft night. Dwayne Carter, who's a great defensive interior guy for Duke. Um, a lot of choices the Chargers can make here. Kate Stover is a really complete tight end. I love uh, Javon Solomon, edge out of Troy. I don't think the Chargers ultimately take edge that high, considering, uh, you know, Bosa and Mack and, and Thule, obviously. But, you know, I, I, I think I do see a lot of Chargers fans not put edge in their mock drafts. But if there is value that the Chargers like, I still think that they kind of would do it, um, honestly, regardless of the positional fit, um, because Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack are probably kind of, you know, their time here ultimately is kind of ticking down with the kind of contracts that they're on. Um, so I don't think they're, the regime, if they find the right fit and find the right value, I don't think they're necessarily prevented from taking edge, uh, you know, long-term here. But for me, I, I think that when I'm looking at this pick, this is a defensive tackle spot for me. Um, ultimately, I, I do like Duke's Dwayne Carter a lot. Uh, I think he is very much the quintessential, like, Minter lineman. Had a little bit of a down year this year on the interior. Um, but I think that, you know, you have him – uh, as a true like 300 pound uh, defensive tackle, which as Arjun has pointed out, that tends to be the size for these pass rushers uh, that uh, Jesse Minter likes in his defenses, uh, has had a great career at Duke in terms of the pass rush, reached a really great year in 2022, um, but was still good on film last year in a lot of capacity as well. Um, I don't think he's going to go super high compared to the other defensive tackles here. Michael Hall Jr., also available on the board. Um, a little bit smaller than maybe uh, the like Minter defense would kind of like, but I still think, you know, he's like maybe 10 pounds below uh, the limit, but his frame isn't necessarily quite as filled out. Uh, but he's obviously still a great pass rusher. I know Tyler is, is very much the Michael Hall uh, junior guy of the podcast. Uh, and then obviously, like I said, the Chargers can kind of go running back here too. I love, love, love Ray Davis out of Kentucky. I will ignore the fact that he was born in the same year that I was in 1999. Um, I, <laughs> I very much will point out that other running backs ages that I don't like uh, <laughs> with Blake Corum and, and other prospects on the board. But with Ray Davis, I will make an exception that he might be a little geriatric um, in, in running back draft years because I just love his game and his tape so much. An absolute delight to watch in terms of uh, him receiving out of the backfield or him rushing just the total complete back that can, that can do it all. Um, you know, 3.81 yards after contact. Uh, he is just absolutely a, a pleasure to watch. Uh, I, I implore anyone who hasn't watched Ray Davis film to get on that. And I think the chargers did meet with, uh, Davis pretty extensively at the combine. Uh, I don't know if they had a private visit after that. I don't think so. Um, but I know I remember that was talked about at the time um, of the combine. So that could be, you know, a potential pick here. Um, in terms of what the Chargers would do, I think this might be a, a Marshawn Lloyd or a defensive tackle spot, given the connections to Marshawn Lloyd on the coaching staff, um, as well as the need for a defensive tackle. I'm going to I'm going to do the Alex mock draft, though. This is my mock draft. Let me have my moment. I am going to take Ray Davis. I think he is the most fun prospect on the board. And then, oh, 
you know, I forgot the Chargers had another pick. I thought I wasn't going to have another pick for another like 30 selections, but oh, yeah, the Keenan Allen trade. So we have a pick right here. Uh, so we still basically have pretty much everyone that was available, uh, you know, from what we just did with the Ray Davis election. We have our running back to pair with Gus Edwards and potentially J.K. Dobbins in the backfield. And uh, now we have the choice of going with, in my opinion, Michael Hall. Michael Hall here, Dwayne Carter. I love both of those guys on the interior. The Chargers could also go with Cade Stover. Uh, I, I like Stover a lot as a prospect. I think he is kind of like the true, um, a true like Harbaugh uh, type of tight end too, in terms of his uh, blocking ability, in terms of his receiving ability. 0% drop rate last year and over 60% contested catch rate, uh, I think is kind of kind of crazy. Granted, it's not necessarily the highest volume uh, in terms of the you know tight ends in this draft, but I think he's definitely a name to watch out for. Um, but, you know, the Chargers did sign Hurst. They did sign um, uh, Disley, right, who is kind of more envisioned as their blocking tight end. So I, I don't think they're prevented from drafting Kate Stover here, but they obviously want to see what they have in, in Hurst. I think it is really important for the Chargers to come away with a good interior defensive lineman here personally. And so that is ultimately why I'm going to go with uh, Ohio State's Michael Hall. I have him and Dwayne Carter like pretty close in my grades, but I, I do think it's hard to argue with the measurables that Michael Hall presents uh, and ultimately his potential at the next level. I don't necessarily buy into like the Aaron Donald comparisons coming out of school that some people have made, um, but I, I think Tyler is very right to be high on him and what he could potentially do in this midfield defense and, and make you know, life easier for Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack on the edges with his, you know, bag of pass rush moves, um, just a, a stud. So going to take Michael home, um, you know, kind of debate whether he would be available there, uh, certainly. Uh, but let's recap what we've done so far. We have taken neighbors. We have taken uh, Zach Frazier. We went with Kyrie Jackson. Uh, we went with Ray Davis, and then we went with Michael Hall. So we've kind of started filling out this roster pretty well. Uh, still still a lot of holes to get to, ultimately. Um, we have Ben Sinat available here. Uh, not so much interested in taking the running backs anymore because we just kind of made the Ray Davis pick, although the Chargers could feasibly double dip later in the draft. Uh, we just took uh, Michael Hall, so I don't think this is a spot, again, where they would take like Christian Boyd or Makai Wingo and double dip that much on the defensive tackle position, although the interior has become more valuable, so you never know. Um, Theo Johnson available, Ben Sinat available. Uh, so I, I think this is kind of the tight end spot for the Chargers. Michael Barrett is available, and I think he is a, a really interesting linebacker from Michigan. Um Maybe it's a little bit of a reach here, but I think the pass rush ability uh, that he would bring in addition to how sound he is in coverage and all that stuff uh, would be an immediate fit. And then you're talking about a guy who, you know, if you don't hit on Junior Colson earlier in this draft, which obviously he was off the board before we could take him, uh, I, I think Michael Barrett is a nice consolation prize for Jesse Minter if he wants to gun for somebody who was on that. Uh, Michigan, uh, you know, team that he knows fairly well. Um, so faced with a lot of decisions here, I do have Michael Barrett graded pretty high. Uh, I, I do like his game a lot, but you could go with Cedric Gray here, obviously linebacker out of North Carolina. Um, for the purposes of this, I, I don't know if he's going to be available this late in the draft. Uh, I do think he gets taken decently earlier, but it's not necessarily a crazy pick range. It's like a seven spot drop. Um, I'm going to go with Ben Sinat. Uh, Steven's posted about him. He is the, you know, either like somewhere between the second or fourth best tight end in this class. I think he is, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, a uh, great route runner who would, you know, add a lot to this team uh, from a receiving standpoint. Um, and I know Steven has gone as far as to say he views Sinat as maybe tight end two in this class over to Tavion Sanders, who's kind of the consensus uh, tight end two. But I really think he, you know, yeah, he's averaged over basically 14 yards per reception the last two years. 
uh, when he's been used. So I, I think he adds, uh, he stretches the field for the Chargers in a certain way from a pass uh, catching perspective that not a ton of the other tight ends that are left at this point in the draft really will do. If you're taking like a, a Barner later on, or if you're taking like a Tip Ryman later on, I think you're more relying on those guys to really be your quintessential like blockers. But like I said, I think that there's nobody kind of at for the remainder of this draft at the tight end position that gives you what Ben Sinat does, both from blocking and a receiving perspective. And it would ultimately just add to the Chargers room and add to the competition of the Chargers room, uh, like uh, Andy Bischoff said the other day at his press conference. So I, I do think the Chargers ultimately draft a tight end. Uh, and I think that this is the spot to do it if the value of Ben Sinat there is real. I don't know if he'll really be available in the fifth round, but based on the PFF board, it was not like a tremendous, you know, drop or anything like, oh, wow, I'm getting, you know, <laughs> a third round guy in the fifth, right? It, it was pretty on point for where, where they ultimately believe he will be. Um, now we have kind of been filling out the positions pretty well. This could be a spot for the Chargers to double dip, uh, maybe at receiver if they wanted to do that. So just to recap, we have neighbors. Uh, we have Kyrie Jackson, we have Zach Frazier, we have Ray Davis, we have Michael Hall, and we have, uh, who did we just take? Uh, crap. Oh, we took uh, Benson Hunt, uh, tight end of Kansas State. Um, so now the Chargers kind of can do a lot of things. They have a little bit more flexibility uh, in terms of the draft and what they can do. Uh, again, this is what I would do. Not necessarily what the Chargers would do. I want to point that out before these last couple picks as a reminder again. I think if I'm sitting here and and the um, availability of Luke McCaffrey is here, who is a incredible athlete uh, that tested really well, obviously brother of Christian McCaffrey. Um, he is a quarterback wide receiver convert uh, who's actually been playing incredibly well and still has more that he can develop into his wide receiver arsenal. If you take Malik Neighbors one and you have McCaffrey, who can kind of be your quintessential like slot outside versatility guy as your like second wide receiver pick, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, you could go uh, Namaya Pritchett here, corner, uh, probably more of a developmental guy than somebody who necessarily is like playing on day one. Uh, Ladarius Henderson is a tackle here. Um, I am not as big of a fan of him as prospect. Um, I think Trent Jones might be the Michigan tackle that I kind of look for a little bit later in the draft coming up here personally. Um, but again, now at this point in the draft, as we're sliding in around six, you're looking less, I think, for instant contributors and more for guys that can, you know, pick their spots uh, and, and contribute as well. Hunter Norzad would be a guy here if we didn't uh, already take Zach Frazier. I think, like Steven and Tyler pointed out, he is a really fun prospect to watch. And I think his ceiling as a result of, you know, only playing at Penn State for as long as he has coming over from the Ivy League uh, could still be super high. For the purposes of what I will do in this mock draft, I will go and double dip at wide receiver. Yes, I'm, I'm very wide receiver pilled here and go with Luke McCaffrey. Um, talking about do I think the Chargers actually will double dip at wide receiver in the draft? I tend to think not. I think they will definitely get a wide receiver within the first two rounds, but they're ha they have been connected to guys like Tyler Boyd. They've been connected to MBS. I think if the value is there in the draft uh, of guys they like on the draft board, then they're not going to be afraid of double dip a receiver. But I also do think they're preparing for a scenario where um, maybe double dipping at wide receiver isn't necessarily a priority for them. So um, yeah. We just got Luke McCaffrey at wide receiver. Uh, I, I think that is really the point before the wide receiver board like really starts to kind of dry up a little bit here. Um, we have uh, a couple other positions to address. We haven't done linebacker. I do think this is a weaker linebacker class, but there's actually a pick uh, that I like. Uh, I like, let's see, Temple's Jordan McGee. Uh, I don't know if anyone has watched him, but I think he is a really outstanding, like kind of juiced up athletic prospect. Again, in year one, he's not going to be a guy that probably starts a bunch of games, uh, considering they have Denzel Perriman on the roster, considering they have uh, Dion, considering they have 
some of the guys that they have in the linebacker room established already. But I think Jordan McGee is a really intriguing prospect who, if you can kind of refine some of these athletic tools that he has a little bit, um, becomes really interesting at the next level. So, uh, yeah, you know what? We're in the seventh round. We are honestly looking for more, you know, people that can kind of contribute on Ryan Fick and special teams in year one than will immediately start by the time we get to the seventh round. So, yeah, I think that's a fine pick to go with Jordan McGee here, who's one of my kind of favorite prospects uh, in the class. Uh, I would implore anyone who hasn't watched him to, to kind of get on that. He is a really fun watch. And then to finish out the draft, uh, we could go with any number of prospects here. We could go with maybe uh, somebody at the tackle position. I think, let me see if Delmar Glaze is still on the board. Delmar Glaze is a interior offensive line to tackle. Convert sort of has that uh, dual ability on the inside and the outside. Wouldn't surprise me if the Chargers go there with the pick. Uh, uh, Carson Barnhart. Uh, is available here uh, if we want a tangible Michigan offensive connection. Um, I think Trent Jones is off the board now. I know he usually, yeah, Trent Jones went to the Raiders in this mock right before we took McGee. Um, so a couple other directions the Chargers could go here, certainly a tackle and kind of boost the depth there. Um, no one is necessarily like screaming. I'm not like necessarily screaming, pick this guy at this point in the board. I do like uh, Edifuan Olofoshio out of linebacker uh, out of Washington, Katzen, uh, Katzen guy right there, uh, who is pretty impressive. And again, kind of like I just mentioned with McGee, I think could be a, a real Ryan Ficken like special teams factor in the year one. Uh, Josh Proctor is a really good safety prospect out of Ohio State, who I you know I think just hasn't found uh, quite the right game to necessarily like vault his name up the draft board. Although I wouldn't be surprised if he goes earlier than the PFF projections have him going. Um, but he would be pretty nice depth, I think, behind a Logan Gilman, behind Durbin James, and maybe kind of plays into the Chargers as like their uh, third kind of rotation safety. Um, so, you know, I, I personally like Josh Proctor's game a lot to the point where I will do that. And that wraps up our first mock draft after 32 minutes. I didn't think I would uh, go on that long. But to recap our haul, we got Malik Neighbors, we got Zach Frazier, Kyrie Jackson, Ray Davis, Michael Hall, Ben Sinat, Luke McCaffrey, Jordan McGee, and Josh Parker. The position that I kind of left out here, obviously, um, would be tackle. I think that's something that the Chargers probably ultimately will address in the draft, but just the value for me, like never lined up. Uh, on the board, unless you kind of do like the trade back scenario early. So uh, that's kind of where we stand uh, in this mock draft. So obviously, let me know what you guys think about the mock draft in the comments below. But now let's delete that and pretend that never happened. And we are going to go with the trade back mock draft. So let's just jump right into it. Um, we are going to trade back with the Vikings ultimately for five and 11 here. Obviously, we see Caleb, May, McCarthy go, but I kind of, you know, even though the Vikings are probably trading up for McCarthy in reality, there's some quarterback left on the board. They'll settle for JT, <laughs> Jaden Daniels in this mock. Um, you know, let's uh, let's just let's just give them that. So I'm going to go 11 and 23 for five uh, with that structure and just kind of force the trade. Obviously, I think you could be talking about uh, later round capital here uh, that the Chargers ultimately could. Uh, or the Vikings could give to the Chargers talking about like uh, third, fourth rounders or, you know, like a 2025 third or other picks here, a future 2025 first. I don't know if that necessarily will be the value, but if they want to trade it for a quarterback, it could be an expensive cost. For the purposes of this, I'm just going to leave it at 11, 23 and five for what it affects this year. But I do think the Chargers ultimately would get like a future pick and maybe a mid round pick out of you know a trade like this but just for the purposes of this exercise let's go with 11 and 23. okay so the board has played out as it has i don't really think romo dunze is going to be there i think he probably goes within those top 10 picks as the other wide receivers do as well um we have uh, Drejan newton we have cooper DeGene. we have pretty much everyone available at the corner and tackle positions except for jc latham and Joe Alt. My preference here 
if I am doing the trade back myself and I control it, I'm going with Terrion Arnold uh, out of Alabama. I think he is uh, the closest thing in this draft to a Sauce Gardner, Patrick Sertan level prospect. I do not think he is as dearly in the tier of those guys, um, but I do think he is the most well-rounded quarterback in this class. There will be a lot of debate between him, to Gene, um, and, and some of the other corners, Nate Wiggins. Um, so there will, there will be a lot of debate near the top of the draft here in terms of which corners are, are, are valued the most. But personally, from watching the film uh, and, and doing the tape, I think he is really the most well-rounded uh, corner here and kind of, again, fits in as your day one starter. Now, what would the Chargers do here in reality? I think if the Chargers do trade back, you're looking at one of three positions. I think the most likely would be tackle. I think you're looking at Teluis Fuaga, who's been mocked to them a bunch, Fatanu, who they actually had their offensive lineman, uh, offensive line coaches working with Fatanu at the pro day. JC Latham went to 10 here. I don't know if JC Latham's actually going to go at 10. Um, but again, I think he's another prospect for them where their offensive line coaches were also working uh, very hands on with him at his pro day. I think that the Chargers, if they do trade back to 11, go with offensive tackle with the first pick. But considering I control it, I'm going to go with corner. Outside chance, like I don't think this is as likely as tackle or uh, corner at 11 scenarios. But I do think there is some chance that they could go uh, for somebody like a Byron Murphy here as well, who's on the board and, and get, you know, mid to really elite. Uh, defensive interior guy who, again, is a game wrecker probably from day one uh, in the league. I think that is also a possibility for the Chargers here. Um, you know, but as I said, what I would kind of figure to do here is go with Terry and Arnold. I think you want the most, the corner with the highest floor in this class. Um, and I think you can kind of, you know, navigate the other rounds with a little bit more, you um, offensive you know uh ingenuity and sort of play the board better if you get you know primary defensive playmaker at this position also I, you know like i said i do think the chargers honestly will go with tackle there um in in real life so to speak but i think that is kind of the best uh potential pick for them there um so all right we started our draft with terry on arnold in terms of this trade back experiment now that we're not going to go with corner here in round one, obviously this opens the door up for somebody like Adonai Mitchell. This opens the door up um, for some of the other wide receiver prospects in this class, you know, so they can do that at this position. And I, I kind of do think if, if the Chargers do make the Minnesota trade back, I think you're looking at offensive tackle slash corner slash defensive tackle being taken with that first pick. And then I do ultimately think you're probably looking at wide receiver taken with that second pick. Adonai is a guy in the mix, but they'll kind of see what the value is and play the board. I think if the wide receivers really start to fly off the board, they could wait until the second round and, and take somebody like a Roman Wilson, um, obviously, or like a Keon Coleman, somebody along those lines as well. Um, but let's just talk about what they'll kind of do here um in this instance i do think they probably go uh with mitchell on the board and that's who i would take as well really big fan of mitchell and he pretty much immediately addresses the chargers need for a wide receiver no i do not think he is as nearly as good as the top three guys in this class and, and marv and neighbors and uh adunze but i do think that mitchell would provide uh, the best wide receiver available for the Chargers uh, in this class. So now that we've started our draft with Terry and Arnold, we've started our draft with um, Adonai Mitchell as well. We can keep going down in the draft here uh, and sort of play the board, uh, you know, to its best value. We don't necessarily have to reach for a uh, wide receiver and, and corner now and can kind of play the board as it comes to us, uh, which I think is, you know, as the Chargers, as good of a position as the Chargers will kind of want to be in uh, on draft night in some type of trade back scenario. We could go with Zach Frazier again. Um, I'll mix it up. I'll go with Braden Fisk here. Uh, 
interior defensive guy, really impressive, obviously was a freak athlete and tested that way at the combine. But I also think people have kind of underrated his tape. Like I, I see a lot of stuff on Twitter about how Fisk is like a workout warrior, but I think the pass rush that he is able to generate um, yeah, kind of, you know, not on his own from the interior because, you know, he did have a lot of talent on that Florida State defensive line, Jared Burse and, and a couple others uh, that, you know, could be drafted as well. And, and, you know, that Florida State team was kind of stacked this year. But uh, I, I really was impressed with uh, kind of the pressure he was able to generate uh, and then also his ability to stop the run. Uh, you know, and he fits the size quota for the Jesse Minter interior defensive line. Uh, it, it, it could be considered a little bit of an overdraft by some people. I know some people that aren't as higher on Fisk uh, maybe as I am, but I think that you bet on the elite athletic traits here and the tape itself is indicative of a player that is ultimately a second, third rounder. You know, I, I don't think this is a crazy overdraft based on the combine right like there are going to be those guys that go but i think if you honestly watch this he is not one of those players and i think he's somebody again that can be a day one starter um so i'm going to go with Braden fisk here at 37 that gets us our defensive interior guy we have our corner we have our wide receiver um and so again we can kind of continue playing the board as we see fit Braylon Trice, I think, is uh, a really incredible um, edge prospect who I think is going to fit in uh, with a lot of teams around the league. I don't know if the Chargers ultimately want to draft an edge this high um, because of you know the implications of that with Bosa and Mack and, and Thule, like I mentioned earlier when I did my first pot draft. Um, but I do kind of think he is like best player on the board, board available here. Um, you know, so I, I kind of would want to do that to some extent. Jonah Ellis just came off the board. And if he was still here, I kind of really wouldn't mind uh, taking him as well. Uh, he, you know, tested like a freak show recently uh, at his pro day with, with the shuttle time he put up. I think he's going to be a, a pretty stud athlete in the pros himself. Um, we, like I said, have our defensive interior guy now in Fisk. We have our wide receiver in our corner. I'm going to kind of look at the running backs here. Um, and I do think that the Chargers need a running back that is um, somebody that can really give them some open field, you know, home run opportunities uh, with some speed, right? I think you just want somebody that has the vision to be able to be employed in a uh, Greg Roman, you know, run game scheme. But I also think you want someone that has the speed and uh, the intangibles to really differentiate uh, their games from what Gus Edwards does as your bell cow back, what J.K. Dobbins might do if, if he is signed to this team. Uh, I think you really want someone who athletically is like a standout change of pace guy uh, from what those two do. This is a spot where you can take Blake Corum as well. I know the Corum people are going to get mad at me, but... I think Jalen Wright is a much better running back prospect than Blake Corum. I know there's Michigan connections. I know they've met with Corum privately. But I would be pretty frustrated if they took Blake Corum over Wright. Uh, I think Wright is an athletic freak. I think he's he might be number one in this class uh, in yards after contact. He uh, is truly explosive, maybe the most fast, elusive back in this class. Um, you could make an argument for him as running back one. I personally would go with somebody like Trey Benson um, slightly over uh, Jalen Wright, but Wright obviously doesn't have some of the injury concerns that Benson or, or Brooks do from their past. I think Wright is a, is a slam dunk here at the running back position. It is a slight overinvestment, but considering we traded back and get got that extra first round pick, I am kind of fine going with running back in the third round. I think the running backs are going to start to fly off the board. And then, you know, by the time you're in like the sixth round, fifth round, you have less of those guys that I think could be like instant contributors, right? I think Jalen Wright makes a ton of sense um, at that pick and really provides athletic upside that maybe some of these remaining backs, as much as I like Ray Davis, who I took in my first mock, uh, as much as I like, uh, you know, some of the other backs that we've been talking about, I think that he provides a quintessential um, explosiveness element that this offense really from a ground game perspective does lack and I think would contrast well 
nice with uh, Edwards, potentially Dobbins, Spiller, uh, and the, the current group that is uh, there right now. All right, so just to recap, we have gone with Terry on Arnold. We've gone with Adonai Mitchell. We have gone with uh, duh, 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 Fisk. We went on the defensive interior, that side of the ball. And uh, then we went with Jalen Wright. So now our mock draft is shaping up pretty good at this point. I think we played the value pretty nicely on the trade back scenario. Uh, we're not going to go with running back here, obviously, with the pick we just made. Um, you know, this could be a scenario where the Chargers decide to uh, double up a corner. Kind of wouldn't be mad if the Chargers decided to do that. You have Javon Solomon, who I mentioned, uh, is, is a really good pass rusher and grades out really well uh, on any of like the analytics charts and stuff that you look uh, look at. I think he is kind of an underrated guy in this class only because he kind of plays at Troy um, and doesn't necessarily have the most accessible, like <laughs> great tape. Um, but I, I do think he is, uh, you know, a standard prospect that could work really well. Um, Kate Stover here at tight end, I mentioned him. I think he's a really good Harbaugh tight end prospect. Uh, that they could look at in sort of this fourth round range. Uh, so Chargers have a lot of choices. I, for the purposes of this exercise, will look to at that interior offensive line spot, uh, and I'm going to go with Bo Limmer. I think Bo Limmer is, uh, you know, your standard uh, kind of center prospect that uh, has a lot of athletic upside with how he tested, um, you know, has had pretty good years uh, all of his seasons in college, seven sacks in three seasons or so. Uh, and I think that he is uh, one of the better uh, prospects in this draft in terms of potentially, you know, I don't know if he starts from day one as uh, maybe like Zach Frazier would. I don't think he would. I think they probably would give it to Bozeman uh, in year one. But um, depending on how things shape up, you could also, you know, have a competition between the two or, you know, allow Limmer to sit for year one and then kind of have Bozeman there or, you know, work it out any ways that you want. But I think Limmer is a guy who can either start from day one or sort of be like your super bench guy, uh, kind of like kind of like the Eagles have done in recent years with uh, Cam Jurgens and, and Kelsey to an extent. Obviously, <laughs> Bozeman not as good as Kelsey, but if they wanted to, you know, let a top 100 like adjacent pick kind of ride the bench for a year, and then let Bozeman walk for a comp pick next year. I think that actually is a pretty like sensible move in terms of how the Chargers could address the center position. Uh, so I'll go with Bo Limmer here. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And then we can still go with tight end. Um, I, I like the idea of going with Stover here uh, after we just picked up uh, Limmer. Again, I think he's very much a hardball tight end as you, as you watch the film. And I think he's more athletic um, than maybe he's given credit for. Uh, I think he's somebody that like seamlessly fits into this system with the type of tight end they're looking for in almost kind of a baby Hurst type fashion. Um, so uh, I think that Stover is kind of a automatic, like a day one fit into uh, what this offense could be. So I'll go with him. Uh, a lot of other options you could go there as well. So we have running back, we have tight end, we have center, we have corner, we have wide receiver, we have running back, like I just mentioned, um, and then we went with Fisk as our defensive interior guy in round two. So we still have a bunch of picks left, as you can see. I think the depth of uh, the options when they do the trade back scenario obviously plays out a little bit better in their favor, um, but we can kind of keep going here. Um, now, uh, now, now this is where the like double down position starts. Um, I honestly will go with Michael Barrett here uh, from Michigan in the fifth round range. I didn't go with a linebacker in my first draft just because I, eh, I think this is a linebacker class as a whole that leaves a lot to be desired unless you get the right value. But considering we didn't really take one uh, in uh, the first mock draft, I think this is a pick that makes a lot of sense. Barrett provides a lot of like pass rush value. Um, I think he can be used in some of those like exotic uh, minter schemes to some degree. So I, I think he's a pick that makes a lot of sense here. If you don't get somebody like a junior Colson earlier in the draft, if you don't get like an edge Cooper, I think Barrett uh, is somebody that makes a lot of sense. So I'll go with Barrett there. And then you kind of see what he does in, in year one in terms of like 
him uh, in a room with, you know, like I said, Perriman, um, Diane Henley. I think that's actually a really like athletic group where you have like your quintessential run stopper and Perriman, who's like awesome, obviously in that capacity. And then you have Henley and Barrett, who I think are two of these like souped up uh, athletic linebacker prospects that can kind of fly in this major defense. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what those guys can do uh, in my hypothetical mock draft world uh, for, for defense here. Um, all right, let's go into the sixth round and speed things up because I've been talking for like 50 minutes here. Um, sixth round, like I said, a lot of options for the Chargers on the board. Just to switch it up, I'm not going to go with wide receiver in this round because of what we just did. Um, this is where I, again, can see the Chargers doubling up at a certain position and um, our tight end room is a little bit full. But I do kind of think the best prospect on the board here is Tip Ryman. Uh, I think Tip Ryman is one of the best blockers in this class. Uh, and you kind of have a wide receiver room reset with him, Hurst. Uh, this, this is a group that's going to need a lot of tight ends. Um, and I don't know how much they really value, like a Donald Parham and Stone Smart, despite what they say. Uh, Barner is obviously here as well if they wanted to go in that direction for another you know, Michigan pick so to speak, we're kind of light on the Michigan picks in this mock draft simulation. Um, you know, I haven't made too many of them outside of uh, Barrett, who I just took. So a lot of uh, potential scenarios for the Chargers here. Um, you can, they can also go tackle, which I, I think is something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, for the purposes of it, I don't really know if they double down on a tight end that's a little bit more like limited in a room where they already have like four or five tight ends at this point, plus Ben Mason. I'll go with Jalen Sundell uh, and really fill the tackle depth there. I think him and uh, Javon Foster are certain guys that are available in like round five, round four range that really have some like upside for the Chargers uh, in terms of what they can do there. Or I should say like round five, round six for like Javon Foster and Sundell that not in year one they would start, but in a world where Pipkins leaves next year after um, – this second year of his contract or they, they cut him and they want to improve that position. I wouldn't be shocked if they wanted to add their depth there and maybe start one of those guys in uh, 2025. So that is kind of a look to the future pick. Again, I, I think that this is prime like safety linebacker range when we talk about like rounds uh, seven here for filling out Ryan Ficken's uh, special teams. I don't think you have as many like, uh, can't miss running back uh, like wide receiver edge type prospects here um but you know we just took a tackle so we took our, our took our medicine a little bit we could take another corner here in like michigan's josh wallace who i think is a guy that minter would be you know pretty interested in um for the purposes of this i'm actually going to draft a guy who's kind of one of my favorite prospects in monmouth's Jaden Sheridan. Uh, who I think is a running back that's not getting necessarily discussed enough. Alex, as always, likes his uh, day three running backs. Um, but I think that this would be a, a pretty interesting pick for the Chargers here, in addition to Jalen Wright, where they just start to have this, like, group of running backs that is, you know, athletically, like, pretty souped up. Again, uh, they can also go with safety here with something like Tyler Owens. Yeah, for the purposes of it, let's double up at running back. Uh, and really establish the trenches and ground game. Uh, something that makes me very, very excited. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, for our last pick here, we can go really uh, any way that we want to. Uh, I didn't pick Delmar Glaze, I think, in that first mock draft, but he is somebody that has a lot of that interior offensive line tackle potential there. Again, I think when you're talking about the guys that you're drafting in round six, round seven, I think that you are really just looking at who can be kind of like an instant fit. I took two tackles. Like, I, I kind of don't care because, you know, I mean, look, we're taking them in like round six, round seven. But for this mock draft experiment, I came out with Tarion Arnold, Adam A. Mitchell, Braden Fisk, Jalen Wright, Bo Limmer, Kate Stover, Michael Barrett, uh, and then some guys in Sundell, Sheridan, and Glaze that I think can be some depth guys that maybe have chances to break out in future seasons. But you know, you do see in the trade back scenario, I think it is easier to get basically like six, seven guys that have instant, you know, starting roles on this team, particularly the first six, Arnold, Mitchell, Fisk, obviously start day one, Jalen Wright, 
in that rotation day one, probably as your running back two. Um, Limmer, I don't know if he starts day one, but he probably pushes Bozeman maybe for that starting job. Stover is a guy that would get a lot of play and run early. Michael Barrett as well, considering how Minter uses him. So a lot of different directions the Chargers can go in the second mock draft. So didn't expect uh, to talk as long as I did, but let me know what was your favorite uh, of the mock draft scenarios in these comments below. Let me know if you are on team trade down or are you on team stick, pick, stick and pick at five. Uh, tell me any of your thoughts on the first round uh, or any of the rounds of the NFL draft right now. Hope you guys like this video and I will see you either next week or when we record the live draft show. So we'll see how things go. Two weeks to the draft. And as always, hold up.